Hello and good morning to everybody who is joining us today. We have a very insightful session planned for you all on the hottest topic of the year, that is APIs, and how you can unlock their potential. That too, without writing any uh, any line of code and uh, any line of code. So let's just get started and let me share the agenda of this webinar. We are going to discuss the current API landscape, and this discussion will be followed by an exclusive product demo of Estera's API management product. Okay, before we go ahead and dive deep into the uh, the topic, let me just get some introductions out of the way. I am Javeria. I am the Associate Product Marketing Manager here at Astera Software. We have a very uh, great panel of speakers over here with the, uh, here today. Uh, starting off, we have Mehdi, who is the founder of the Worldwide API Days Conference series, which he started in 2012. Mehdi is highly involved in the API community and industry as an author, lecturer, consultant. He is also an active investor in the API tooling space. We also have with us Amancio, who is the author of API Product Management book. He has got several years of experience as an API product manager, product owner, and a technical lead, and has helped many businesses create successful API products. We have with us um, Mike Quinn, who is the Chief Technology Officer at Estera Software. Mike has a decade worth of experience in data management real and has helped leading uh, uh, organizations across a variety of industry implement data-driven initiatives using Estera's no-code automation platform. Great to have you all today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Okay, so before we go ahead, uh, just a little note for our attendees. I'm sure as we discuss this interesting topic, you might have some questions. Please go ahead and type them in the chat box under the Q&A tab, and we will make sure that we get back to you by the end of this webinar. Okay, so uh, let me just quickly share some statistics about what is happening in the API landscape. APIs are often associated with the term digital transformation. APIs promise better operational efficiency, great customer experiences, and we can see by the growth in the API landscape, as you can see, the global API management market is expected to reach $41.5 billion by 2031. Uh, on the Postman platform in the year 2022, 38 million collections and 1.13 billion requests were created. And there are uh, another statistic to state over here is that there are over 22 billion API repositories on GitHub. So we can clearly see that the API landscape is booming. There is so much growth over here. So let me just go ahead and ask our panelists what is their opinion on it. So Mehdi, you recently published this uh, report on API landscape. Uh, can you shed some light on what is happening in the landscape and what is driving all of this growth? What do you? Yeah, thank you very much. Actually, there's a lot of things happening in the, in the API space uh, these days. Uh, actually, we can resume them. We can resume them in six trends that actually can be seen. So, I invite people to look at the API landscape that we maintain on API landscape that API we, we, we look for 1,200 API tools and or API companies. And we track every metrics, you know, the funding, the number of employees, the current product and everything. So the, the trends I'm sharing with you are based on these 1200, uh, uh, let's say companies, right? And we follow, we have followed them over the last 10 years. So it's really trends that are, you know, um, uh, actually uh, um, from the field. So the first trend is that the open source aspect, you know, we see more and more open source tooling in the API management space. Uh, you can check on the landscape there are many, many open source tools. Uh, that's the first thing. The second, the second um, uh, one we see is the regulations. We see more and more regulation into the API space, uh, in banking regulation, in healthcare regulation, in logistics, in supply chain. Uh, so many, many countries are adopting regulation, obliging companies to open APIs. That's really the second trend. Uh, also the you know privacy regulations, you know GDPR, CCPA in California, and so many others. Because of this regulation, we have the third trend. The third trend is. Like a product which are specific to specific industries. So now we see some API management solution dedicated to banking, dedicated to privacy, or dedicated to insurance. So it's the same idea, same idea, uh, because of the regulation dedicated to it, right? The fourth, the fourth one is really the security aspect. So API management used to be uh, like, a, a, you know, have security inside, but now new attacks, new threats, oblige new security layers. So now API security is a standalone market and tooling, you know, in the API industry landscape. I mean, last year, we got like $200 million in, in money raised just on pure player on API security. So that's, that's really uh, uh, noticeable uh, to consider. Uh, and 
inside this API security thing, we have a little bit of privacy tools, API privacy tools. I've heard privacy API gateways, you know, something appearing. So it's an early trend, but, but, but it's, uh, it's really uh, uh, happening. The, the fourth one is the, what the API as a product. So it's not you. We talked a lot about APIs can be product, you know, they can be monetized or they can be like a specific capability that you export to others and you monetize uh, directly. Uh, or internally, and so we see more and more of these API products. So now there are hundreds of payment APIs, hundreds of SMS APIs, so many others um, uh, uh, like capability as a service, right? Or business process as a service. So now every brick, every layer of the software someone may need to build a company, there's probably a product API just for that, right? So just that's really the fourth trend that is really at scale. It's not just the Twilio or the Stripe of the time. Now. Every company at some point is delivering capability to an API. And the fifth one, one we're also uh, maybe interested in the later demo, is the no-code aspect. The no-code, so as we say, uh, the trend um, of citizen developers, you know, the fact that uh, you know, we're able to have uh, a non-coder or non-technical uh, people, but still, be, still being able to code, to build software, to design APIs, to build APIs, to share internally, we think we lack of 8 million developers by 2030. So we need to embrace new developers, citizen developers, the no-code aspect, to embrace the software revolution, to build software, and to design software. So this trend is actually really huge. Uh, there's really companies who are actually, uh, you know, blooming on that topic. Uh, some top software vendor acquire, you know, many no-code tooling to, to ensure they miss that space. Uh, so, so yes, that's 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 really what we see. The last one I would add that is really recent is the AI APIs. Just to let you know, like because of the chat GPT and you know the generative AI war, since three months we see so many new AI APIs. But funny enough, the no code and the AI APIs are currently merging, you know, into AI automation because of, of uh, no code and APIs. So uh, that's really the trend that we're we're watching right. Now. That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah we're, we're kind of seeing the, the same thing with this whole AI stuff. So uh, I'm glad you kind of added that part at the end. Thank you for sharing your insight, Preeti. Amancio, would you like to add to this? Uh, how has your experience been like? How uh, has the landscape changed for you over the past 10 years? Yeah, quite a lot. So uh, I remember so 2013, uh, 13, 2014, it was all conference about, okay, what APIs do we expose? And everybody showed off, okay, this is the list. These are the, the successful APIs that we are able to uh, put on our API management platform. Next year, okay, <laughs> everybody was disappointed because usually there were no usage. So the whole industry, the whole community started to learn, okay, what makes really an API successful? It's not just exposing your backends out there. So from inside, outside, but really change kind of the perspective from outside to inside. So what are the needs, the problems out there? And to really translate, okay, what APIs, with what APIs can we really solve those problems? So this is the, I think that the fourth trend that uh, Mehdi mentioned is API as a product uh, perspective that really came uh, during this time. Now it's also quite um, changing. It was in the beginning really exposing you as a company to others, then kind of, okay, that's the wrong idea. Nobody cares about APIs, but they care about their problems and we can solve that. So API products, now it's more and more going to building ecosystems. So people or companies realize, okay, there are customer journeys and we need partners building ecosystems to really uh, um, serve customers and helping them on the customer journey and really not being the best in your industry, but have a competition of uh, ecosystems. So companies by other companies make part Partnerships, for instance, in finance, banking, uh, collaborate with finance, with car uh, uh, sellers to, uh, to when people buy a car, to get an insurance, to get the number plate and so on, really complete customer journey, really creating closed ecosystems that are really not, uh, uh, you can't compete against those ecosystems. So that's really kind of development that I see. Thank you for sharing your insights. Uh, Mike, I would like to jump onto you. And uh, uh, so, uh, uh, Astera has been uh, in the data management realm for some time, right? So, yeah. what made you decide that you have to uh, you know, launch an API management product? What was the trend, trend that you, you were seeing amongst our customers? I, I think it goes back to um, what 
um, what was said before, what Amancio said before, is that uh, you know that there is a shift in kind of how uh, people are working with data and partners and external data, and and we see that from um, you know the, our customer base, our prospects that we talk to. Um, and so we do see that shift. So we've been in the ETL business for a long time now. And over the years, we've kind of come to understand that organizations generally use our tool sets to um, ingest data, load data into, you know, just huge amounts of data into other systems. Uh, but with the ultimate goal of publishing this data uh, by consumption by some human being or some other systems. Um, so sometimes this reporting, this tool is a reporting tool. Uh, but many times it's a website or even a web API. So it made sense for us to just not be the means to an end, but also be the ability to uh, expose endpoints. So, um, and we also see patterns shifting away from the whole old batch processing where you would have data ingested overnight and then have it ready in the morning for reporting. So that's something that, you know, used to happen very regularly 10, 15 years ago. And now it's more, okay, we need this data in, in real time. Uh, we need to consume it now. We need to know the answer to this stuff now. So this is becoming more and more how departments and companies are sharing data within an organization, how they talk to each other. I think Amazon is very famous for that. Every, every single uh, department with Amazon had to communicate via web services. And, and you saw, you know, we all know how successful Amazon is, right? So uh, I think we're starting to see that that kind of mindset be, being adopted more and more, um, not just within an organization, but also how organizations deal with their partners. So we thought it was a good idea to combine our experience building, you know, analyst um, uh, friendly, you know, you don't have to be a coder to use our tools, um, production experience and apply that to being able to, you know, develop and manage APIs in a, in a simplified manner. So that's, that's kind of where that came from. So uh, you can clearly see that uh, companies that use APIs have uh, different, uh, you know, are very uh, different from the companies that don't use APIs. So a professor at Boston University conducted research on firms uh, over a four-year-long period, and he found out that a firm that use APIs saw a 12.7 percent more growth in market capitalization uh, as compared to those who that did not uh, adopt APIs. So maybe uh, would you like to comment on this? So uh, the companies that are adopting APIs. What are they usually using APIs uh, for? So, what is the main? What are some of the main use cases that is adding to their growth with APIs? Uh, Mehdi, uh, sorry, Mehdi. we can't hear you, Mehdi. So, actually, this researcher is Marshall von Alstein. He's the author of yeah. the book Platform Revolution. So, he's he's a New York bestseller on you know how platform models are changing the game of the of the business. And actually, he shared uh, uh, four numbers. The first one, the first one is sixty eight percent. So, company who have strong API strategy, like public API strategy, over ten years, in average, generate sixty eight percent more revenues. He say that because they are reverting the firm by opening APIs to others, you maximize your distribution channels because there are more experts, more um, innovators outside the company than inside. So if you think it's inter just internally, you are you are not able to grow all the, the products and the channels you may you may be able to make business with. But if you open it to third parties, these third parties know their channels, they know their business, they will consume your capabilities and distribute them, embed them in their system. So like this, you say the developers are reverting the firm. So if you open APIs, you know, you, you, you scale your reach, you scale your ubiquity and you scale your market potential. So 68% more revenue, 38% is the second number, 38% is more profit, you know, so revenue 68%, 38% more profit in average over 10 years. And he explained that because uh, these companies are able to accumulate value because when you build a, with an API of someone else, he is now the platform. You know, when you open an API and someone builds with your API, he considers you the platform. Your capability is the platform for their business. So you can scale also your business and, and, and revenues. But these platform models that have, we have seen with Airbnb, Uber, in the B2C market, in the B2B market, right, APIs are enable you to be these, these, these platforms uh, model. The third number he reached is he gives it's 12% actually. When you have a strong internal API strategy, 
he shows that in average you spend 12% less expenses to innovate, you know, to build, to innovate, to maintain software because APIs are enabling to uh, interact better, you know, more in a more standardized way, more fast, faster with less maintenance uh, if they're well designed. Uh, you know, break the silos. So he, he demonstrates this compound e effect, this compound interest by building APIs to communicate and replace all web services or all uh, file transfer models. And it has it accumulates value at scale in average twelve percent less revenues. The last number I will share is the one you share is twelve point seven percent. And because of companies who have better revenues, <laughs> better profits, and uh, save costs. Actually, they value more on the market. So this is why he showed that in average, over 200 companies, uh, companies who have a strong API strategy and which is known publicly, investor value it more by 12%. And just to let you know, it's companies over $2 billion of valuation. So 12% on company in average over $2 billion of valuation. You can estimate that, you know, approximately the, a strong API strategy gives you a $250 million market valuation extra because the investor trust in your ability to open your system be a platform and be an ecosystem orchestrator and be a giant developing product michael told about that amazon did it 20 years ago 20 years ago and you can see the compound interest you can see the growth of amazon like it's really exponential so now it's time for a company to do the same Great insights, thank you. Manzi, what, what, what is your experience? So what are some of the use cases that companies use APIs for? <clears throat> so that's uh, depending really on the industries. And I think also uh, when you start with APIs, uh, um, first question is always, okay, what APIs do we have to build first? And usually this is a, um, a very misleading or dangerous question because you don't start with that. As I maybe said, if you have a strong API strategy, uh, um, that's kind of the first thing that you have to figure out. I mean, there is a lot case where you don't have a clear picture about the strategy yet, but you are more exp uh, uh, experimenting, trying things out. This is also a viable option, <clears throat> but has a, yeah, it's more kind of a kind of a learning process involved. So when you have really kind of a strong API strategy, then you need user, you understand the user values, what problems do you really need to solve? That depends on the industries, but it also requires a company to go more outside, really talk to the customers, to the users to understand uh, the problems. And then uh, the third part is kind of the, the business value. Uh, as maybe said, okay, monetizing, that's one option, uh, but take Google search. So Google search, great service. It's just for free, but they collect data that they can then use uh, for their ad, uh, ad business. And with that, you can create a, a big fortune or Google is, uh, does that. So depending on the, on the, on the industries uh, and for different things, sometimes more internally, as I maybe said, okay, it's really for internal innovation because people have really, it's there. You can use it, you have an idea, you can combine different APIs internally, externally to create uh, uh, business cases. <clears throat> That's what the what companies uh, are doing right now. Okay. Um, Mike, uh, but does your experience track with this? Uh, what are some of the use cases that our customers go for when it comes to APIs? Um, I, I, I just think it's a matter of agility. I, I think that, uh, you know, Mehdi said it very well that the reason why companies are profitable is because they are more efficient. And, uh, and communicating and having a, a proper API infrastructure just makes you more efficient. And, uh, and these companies have just reams and reams of data. We're talking about huge legacy uh, systems like, you know, that just have a, an, a, an immense amount of value behind them, just locked away, kind of siloed. And if you can leverage that, the companies that can leverage that information can uh, monetize it. So, you know, and, and not just externally to their partners, but, you know, but for innovations from within their own organization. So for example, if you have, you know, data socked away in an AS400 somewhere, is it, you know, easier to hire a programmer, somebody who understands that system and being able to write queries for it? And then when you need that information to go to that same person, or is it easier to wrap that up in an API and then have that data accessible from, you know, some other department within within your organization? 
and then there's just and then there's just more and more external and internal services out there now. So you mentioned Google, you mentioned I think ChatGPT was one of them. That's going to be the next big one. Uh, but there's all this customer CRM data out there. There's um, there's address information APIs, and you can use this now, right? So you can you can have your system and enrich it and provide more value by um, by utilizing these external APIs that exist out there. So as far as which ones you're creating, we're seeing this, you know, all kinds of different things. Everybody that's uh, every from all kinds of verticals, whether it be health insurance, whether it be um, uh, other kind of car insurance, retail, whatever. Everybody's kind of upping their game and getting into this uh, ecosystem that you guys talked about, uh, being able to share data and uh, offer a lot more value than they were before. Through APIs. So, I might have a follow-up question. So, uh, with this, uh, we have a very uh, a lot of buzzwords coming out. So, API like development API first. So, can you shed some light on uh, what uh, this API? What do we mean by API first and API like development, and you know how it is better than uh, the traditional development approach? Is this a question for me? Yeah, or okay. maybe anybody. Who does. Oh, okay. Well. Um... All right. So, I mean, to me, my, as I understand it, it just means that uh, you're you're starting with the API layer, right? So every every system now has your front end, your back end, and then your API layer, you know, kind of in the middle. So I think if you start and with the I with the mindset that you're going to have multiple applications supported by your API. Um, it's going to make those applications much more successful than if you're kind of developing them at the same time. So if you start with the API, I believe you'll be much more successful in, you know, whatever. You can even have a different team develop the front end at that point if your API is robust enough. So, I mean, that's my understanding. Can you guys correct me if I'm wrong? But that's, that's kind of how we see it. That's kind of how we do it here at Estera. Yeah. So maybe would you like to add one to it? Yeah, actually, there. Uh, totally agree with with Michael. I would just add uh, some 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 elements. Uh, yeah, it's true. When you take the, you know, you have more channels now. You know, uh, how many clients you may have. When I say clients, is uh, so software clients, not just customer, right? But clients like a website, a mobile a mobile application, or a few, uh, you know, external applications, few integration into marketplaces, into third party systems, into a third party, whatever, ERPs, CRM, whatever you need to be integrated with, uh, Internet of Things, connected objects, connected cars. There are many, many ways where your software can be embedded or can be connected to, right? And if you had to build one application for each, and again, sometimes you have to build one for every country uh, or every region because of regulation and stuff, that would be too many software, too much software. You will not be able to maintain it at scale. The goal of this API first layer is that you will build the API first, the technical contract and the interface that will connect with the back end. So now all your front ends or your client applications can actually connect with the API, consume the API. So you're free to update the back end, you know, to refactor the back end, change, you know, go to microservices or, uh, or change for database. Because we, the only the application we only see the interface the API layer so that enables you to change the backend to to update or for performance for many things but always keep the same interface contract for dozens hundreds of client applications so this is why it saves so many times so much times and company like Netflix or Dropbox or Amazon have demonstrated that with an API layer you can maintain hundreds of client application with the same team versus just a dozen if you know it's just like siloed application. So this is why the API first is extremely important. The second thing is also the, the, uh, the standards that have emerged. So since the last 10 years, we have the, um, now we call it the open API specification, but that was called Swagger. You know, it's description for APIs that enable developers to have what we call a contract driven development. So if you mix API first and contract driven developments that developer now, the, the design of the API can be specified by, by the business, by API designers, but the developers know exactly how they need to code the API with that interface contract, you know, and so that, that helps to maintain a coherence, to maintain a governance, a guidelines into building these APIs that will serve the so many clients. So uh, API first architecture, contract driven development. And I will just finish by a new trend, which is API first business, because API first business 
is that launching the API before the UI, right? Instead of, even if you want to build end up user application, you, you know, that will take you two years maybe, right? You know, fully featured. You will spend three months to just publish the API first. You know, on the business side, you will expose it to developers. You will get what people want to do with it. And you will learn with API management, you will learn how people use it, you know, over time. But you will build your UI, you will build your application in the same time, but learning instead of taking the risk of building the whole application and not learning along the way. So three ways to, uh, uh, to adopt like API first mindset on the architecture, you know, for multiplying clients without uh, uh, at scale, on contract driven development for developers to always know the definition of the API they want to build and API first business to try the value proposition, try the capability before the end user application and embrace a developer community or a partner community to build the end user application that you want to build and uh, for your customers. May I, be, I can also add on that, uh, Amidi, because yes, I've just seen it also uh, with some companies, especially startups. They have a cool technology, for instance, uh, one, one startup on, on weather forecasting based on AI real time and so on, really uh, uh, revolutionizing uh, this space. They provide an API because they don't know yet what product to build, what UI to build. So they push the APIs, let developers use it. And when they see, okay, there's some traction, developers or companies are using it then interviewing those, identifying them as, a, as an early adopter, early customer, and then really understand, okay, how can our product or our API or our service like technology really create value and then build uh, uh, the product out of that. So with UIs, auto API products and so on. So that's also one strategy, product-led growth. Uh, it's called in, in product management, uh, one approach, uh, how uh, APIs can really uh, make a difference. That, that's really interesting and it kind of speaks to kind of what we see, you know, internally, we develop applications and, and like you said, it, it is a big risk to develop an application to start with the API and, 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 and monetize that or find value in the API first. I mean, if we, if we could do that, we're not, we're not in that business, but if we could, that, that would solve, you know, a lot of issues that we see internally, you know, when we you know, take you talking about risk and developing applications, if, mm -hmm. if we had the API up front and we could get feedback on that first, man, that would, that would be a game changer. For sure. So uh, we can clearly see uh, how APIs are adding value to businesses. So when it comes to building APIs, right? So I have a very uh, interesting uh, statistic over here by Postman, let me just, uh, so this is the, a chart from the Postman State of API Report 2022. So you can clearly see there's a lot of involvement from the technical developers, right? And we can see some involvement from business analysts and data analysts and CEOs. So Matthew, you have been a product manager for quite some time. So when it comes to, uh, for companies that are starting out, so what does an ideal API team look like? And uh, is it important to have business stakeholders in that team? Um. First of all, yeah, business stakeholders are important, but I come later to that. So what does an ideal uh, API team look like? So ideally, it's not one API team, so it's really kind of an API team responsibility for every team. It's like the Amazon approach to so everybody needs to uh, publish their APIs. But when it comes to kind of the roles, uh, it's really a product manager who really does the foundational work, like, okay, what is the company strategy? What are the goals for, for the API, for the company, OKRs, and so on? and really understanding who will be the consumer, what are their problems, their needs, what are the alternatives they are unhappy for, and also what are non-goals for, 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 for the APIs. Then I'll also understand how do we want to uh, capture the value that we provide to the customer? How do we want to capture to create a business value? How do we monetize that or do we collect data? How can we use this data to create other products or uh, create uh, other type of revenue to improve our, uh, um, our services. Then the API designer, and to be honest, I did make a big mistakes in, in the past because I thought, okay, API designer, he's responsible for, for API specifications, but it's so much more. So uh, during the time when I worked with UX designers, I really understood, okay, the value of designers. An API designer has really not only to uh, consider, okay, are we going to go for camel case or snake case or kebab case? Uh, how do we call it the attributes and so on and the objects, but also how do we 
or how do we let the developers interact with the APIs? So not only just having kind of a, a access to a database, but if we have, for instance, the order fulfillment API that has really certain steps and with updates uh, and so on, callback functions and so on, how do they interact with that? How do we communicate uh, our brand via error codes, via documentation, via API portal? So really kind of the visual designer, uh, the, the, the UI designer or the API specification designer, the UX designer, the interaction designer. So really these kind of responsibilities within uh, um, the API designer. Could also be in the end the API product manager that is uh, uh, responsible for that. Then of course DevOps, uh, you build it, you ship it, uh, you run it. So it's really crucial. And when you build an API uh, that you also have to run it, you have to maintain it, look that it's always working together with the backend. Also who, if a, if a, if a consumer, an API consumer has a problem that API doesn't work, who should it contact? So usually it's always the API team responsible for that. And how do you orchestrate or triage at those requests? And then testing CICD and so on. But also in, uh, let's say recent years, security became more and more an issue. It's not just about authentication, authorizations, but really about the huge threats because um, it's also what I experienced, for instance, we had a super great security proxy in front of the API management platform. We thought we are safe. Then a colleague of mine wanted to use our one API from another department and then did some stress test and then the security proxy, proxy just went down and the complete API management platform was not usable. Uh, it was quite a critical issue, but these things happen and also uh, security threats. So when you expose yourself also internally, because most threats come from internal uh, uh, people, you need to make really sure that uh, everything is uh, is safe and secure, especially with uh, with data leaks and so on. Okay. Uh, maybe uh, you have been conducting API days conferences for quite some time. So, uh, what is your take on the involvement of business stakeholders? Has the composition of your conferences changed? Uh, uh, is it more? Uh, is it you know? Do you have more business stakeholders, business users in the conferences participating now? Yes, actually, uh, the, the first conference was 200 tech people over and over and over. Now we have a, we have a 80 conference, with a one, eight zero, right? So 80 conferences uh, uh, strong. And now like the average attendance is 30% business people uh, and 70% tech people. But just an example, now in our next New York event, we have four business tracks, just to let you know. So four business tracks and six technical tracks, but just to let you know how the business people, the non-technical people, but sometimes the budget owner, the business owner, the decision maker, the sponsors are actually thinking about APIs. And just to let you know, on, uh, on, my, uh, in my, uh, on my consulting practice, most of the time I'm, I'm consulted of, of sometimes for developers, for architects, you know, a group, you know, give an update, but most of the time it's for C-levels, you know, C-levels of, uh, of a large group, Fortune 1000 groups to actually tell them why API is a business term. Like my team's telling me APIs are business terms. For me, it's still a technical term. Just explain us in terms of strategy, what does that mean? And then I talk to them about platform models, ecosystem orchestrator models, marketplaces models, and then they understand that, you know, uh, what are APIs. But, uh, and so when they understand that, it, it goes down to the business owner. And so now you can see so many, just type on, on, on LinkedIn, API product manager. You Now we can see, dozens of thousands of results, uh, you know, like of people in, in some banks, for example, US Bank or Capital Capital One, there are dozens of API product manager, you know, everyone owning one part of the business that is now an API first, you know, delivering an application or a dashboard at the end, but no, there is also an API available. So now it's really key. The business people are owner more and more about the API topic or the API strategy and sometimes the API products and they work closely with the developers and there is actually and finally the API is finally the, the interface between the business and the tech. The business specifies the API, the tech delivers the route, the software, the service that delivers you know the value proposition and the capability that needs to be built and this is why with this clear separation between the business designer and the tech enabler more and more business people are 
going down to the interface level and own the interface level where it's more mostly technical people before. So this interface is really at stake here, uh, but more business people are, are conquering this because if you open an API, you know, to third parties, you need to understand why they will use it. What are the use cases, the business use cases? And this is what the business knows better than developers or architects. Thank you. Uh, so Mike, uh, like maybe mentioned about the involvement of business users. So uh, our product is code free and, you know, it's user friendly for business users. What is your take on the importance of uh, involving business users in the API, in entire API management process? I, I, I think, I don't think this can be um, uh, overstated. I think it's, uh, I think it's huge. And um, like Mehdi said about that, the, the business analysts coming down to the level of the interface, I think you, that has a tremendous effect on what you're, what it is you're developing. If you've ever seen an API that was, you know, developed under, you know, in, behind, you know, uh, without, out of view, out of sunshine, right? You see what, what you end up with, right? If no, if it just goes computer to computer and you actually see what that, the structure of that API developed look like, it's terrible, right? So it, it needs some, some level of sunshine. And the more that, that is out there, the more if it's in the domain of the business analyst, the, the cleaner um, work you're going to end up with. So some of, and, and we've seen this and, you know, just from experience, we've developed APIs and they work, they work great. And then we have somebody who's not a coder and say, hey, you know, maybe somebody, you know, some analysts in our team say, hey, we want you to use this API uh, just to kind of see what the user experience is. Then we get kind of all this feedback about, you know, this, I had issue with this. I don't understand this. Why is it like this? And so on and so forth. So I think that um, we've worked with tons of organizations and lots of different projects. And the, the really successful ones have been always been the mix of the business analyst along with the more technical people. I think nothing beats domain, domain experts when they're, you're trying to solve the problem. So the ones um, that understand the data the best, if they have more agency to be able to uh, influence or even implement some of these solutions, that is where I think a lot, where we see a lot of our, our customers, what they're trying to get to, right? They, they all, try out our software and they'll purposely not have their super duper developer you know work with it right they know that they can use it they know they can use whatever platform and no problem they're trying to to enable your business analysts to be able to self-serve right to be able to do it themselves and and i think the companies that can shrink the gap between the person that understands their data and the one that's developing the the solution are the ones that are have been successful and the ones that are going to be successful. Okay. So I think we have established over here that the involvement of business users is very uh, important in API management process. Absolutely. And uh, because, uh, yeah, so since business users uh, need to be involved, it is important that everybody speaks the same language, right? Because APIs have always been the IP domain, something very uh, overwhelming for everybody else. Right? So one of the uh, one of the uh, ways to do that is through using no code and easy to use tools, right? Uh, Bhedi, as you mentioned uh, that you see a trend of, uh, you know, the rise in the no code tools. How, can you just shed some light on how the no code tools help the entire API management process? So the the the, the local tools appear appears on different on different aspects. Um, uh, the, the the first one is on the API side is really the, the API design. You know, building the API specification or the Open API file. Uh, you know, the technical contract. You know, decided with the business and before it was mostly written by developers or architects uh, that were not aware completely about the business and the capabilities that user uh, wanted. So now the business can be involved, and sometimes the business is even the owner. And now with new generation of tools, and I think we will see a demo in a few minutes, but with new generation of tools, even business developer can build API specification that developer will respect or architect will respect. And so they will they will work with it. They will not say, okay, you did something, no code. No code in that sense was most of the time something that will be, will be thrown away after when they go to developers. But now with this recent tooling, the API design from no code tools actually is usable directly by the developers and the architects. So that's a lot of things that have emerged. We see also no code in API management. Uh, as we said, we see a lot more shift left in API management. We've seen many tools that if you have now an API specification and you have already a kind of some kind of uh, endpoints uh, uh, endpoint created in a company, you can actually 
without code, you can build your policies, build your plans, build your rate limiting, your quotas, you know, just in a complete no code manner, no code aspect. So you can be really managing it from the business point of view, the analytics point of view, and not just the technical point of view or the security point of view, uh, right? So that's really the aspect. And just to finish on the security side, again, still, we still need some developers and, and uh, on that front, but the scope management, the, ability, the authorization level management also now is completely, uh, in most of the platform, that it completely set up in a no-code manner where actually you can design then the plans, the management, the analytics, the security, and the design of the API. And just to finish, when you have this, you can generate documentation. So even the documentation is no code at some point, because now from the API specification, you can generate interactive documentation uh, with a code that's been built with others but that you can generate. So now the API management layer is now more and more low code. We still have some parts where it's not, we still need to code at some point, right? But uh, the, the, the management layer is being more and more low code to embrace the new generation of citizen developers, of business owners, that wants to be in that in the business of what we say the platform economy, the marketplace economy, the the, the ecosystem or orchestration economy, or the internal platforms. You know the ability to break silos, make business entities work together. You know uh, versus like everyone is in own silos and re not reusing software, replicating software. So that's really what we see. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Mancio, what has your experience been like? Do you see, uh, you know, how a no code and low code tools uh, add agility to API product management? Um, sure. I mean, <clears throat> before it was really like, um, as uh, Mike already also uh, mentioned, like, okay, if you have one expert, a domain expert who really understands the data, the business logic, and then you have an API development team, uh, usually um, they need to make so much uh, uh, um, decisions, they find uh, edge cases and so on, they need to make decisions and you hire smart people, so you should enable them to make smart decisions. And that may, means you give, give them responsibility, but also context, so the knowledge, why are we doing that? What's the kind of the context, the domain and the business logic about that and with no code? You enable the one, the test, the context, the understanding to build those APIs uh, uh, without the coding experience. And this is a huge uh, benefit. Thank you. Uh, so Mike, uh, what is your, uh, you know, take on the importance of no code tools since you have developed a no code tool and can you give us an overview of how Estera API management helps us with the, uh, you know? Great. <laughs> no, but um, just like like everything else, a, a problem, you know, all problems start in the coding department, right? Um, something, you know, we have a problem, we need to solve it, let's develop a solution for it. So that's where the programmers come in. So over time, like everything else, everyone ends up building the same thing, right? Over, you know, and they go to Stack Exchange, how do I do this? And, and so what you find is that the there's the really interesting part of your API, the solution you're building, and then everything else is kind of just boilerplate, right? So after a while, you know, why code that over and over again? Why not, why not build your APIs in a manner like you design them, like on a whiteboard, right? So if, uh, and this goes to the no code uh, aspect of it. So if you have some UI paradigm, like a diagram or a whiteboard or some other UI paradigm, doesn't matter what it is, um, you can get, and focus on the, the really interesting business critical part of your um, the solution or API that you're trying to do it. And the rest of it can be done declaratively. So I think that's that's kind of where our opinion or our perspective is of that. And we think that, that we're not the only ones, that there's a lot of people kind of thinking the same way, that if I could develop this, like I think about it and then even more importantly, manage it without having to go to a developer, right? And I think that's kind of now, we talked about some of these, um, um, you know, uh, specifications that you have to adhere to, these policies. Um, that's something that's going to have to be, you know, dynamic, right? So that's something that you're going to have to give um, somebody besides the developer the ability to uh, govern. You know, we're talking then, now you're getting into kind of data governance. How do I, uh, manage all of these APIs? How do I manage all these this data endpoints that I have? I, I, I need to be able to give it to this team, but not that team. That's something that has to be very flexible. And uh, and I think um, 
at some point you have to have some kind of security outside of the development team or the development aspect of that project. So yeah, that's um, that's where we see the, the whole no code, low code thing um, going. A lot of this stuff is is uh, is been done before. And so if you can de design it declaratively, um, you know, why not? Why not do it that way? So now that we have talked a lot about uh, the low code and low code approach, uh, let's without further ado, let's just move on to our product demo. I'll hand it over to you, Solia, who is our product manager, and she's going to give you a short demo of how Acera API management code free product looks like. Uh, over to you, Solia. Thank you, Javeria. So I'll just go on and uh, share my screen uh, to give a brief demo of how uh, Estera's API management uh, product functions. All right, so uh, this is how our uh, uh, product looks like. Uh, if you can see that I have uh, enter off my screen, I have a designer and this designer is actually nine API flows. And in each API flow and be, uh, you, it can be called as a single API endpoint. Now this, this whole product is uh, based on no code uh, drag and drop interface, which means uh, not just technical users, but even uh, even business users can uh, not only manage the complete API, but also uh, be involved and uh, be themselves uh, doing all the uh, all the creation and implementation of APIs because they're the ones that we just are the ones who uh, who actually bring about the need for any API uh, to drive businesses. Uh, so over here, uh, the first uh, window that we're seeing here, this is how an API looks like. It uh, it consists of a request object. Uh, there's a starting point where you define your uh, request uh, definition for the AI, and it consists of uh, the response object, which is the uh, ending part of your API flow. And at the center of this is where uh, you can imagine to be a black box uh, where you actually design or implement flow of your API uh, with incoming data from your uh, API consumer, how you are going to treat data and uh, process that to suit your business needs. And in order to, for us to design uh, this API, we have a toolbox available. As you can see on my right hand side, this is a toolbox panel, which is so various options that you can use to build APIs. Uh, you can create a base uh, APIs or uh, even uh, use other file sources other API services as part of uh, your own APIs and create uh, uh, and then transform data, however, uh, you know, the incoming data and integrating it from various sources, join multiple sources together, and then form your own API on top of it. So this is a brief overview of what an API flow looks like. Uh, we'll go to the uh, example that I already set up here. Uh, this one is um, an API to get all orders from a database uh, lookup table. Uh, what it does is uh, here I have defined a get request. This get request has two parameters as you can see. One is an order ID and one is a product name. Uh, as soon as I receive a product name from as part of my API request, I'm doing a lookup uh, in the order details table and fetching all of the records uh, that um, that specified uh, the product name and them uh, as my response to the API. Now this this looks a pretty basic uh, API flow, but it it covers a you know a very common use case of how APIs fit um, in, in businesses. And uh, another cool feature of this uh, ap is uh, of our product of the Stereo API management product is that when you're designing and implementing your APIs at the same time, you have the capability of uh, a take a uh, sneak peek at your, at your data. So at any point in time, you can right click on uh, any of the object flow. And uh, as soon as you right click and preview, you can take a, a peek of how your data is performing based on some test values. So you're not just uh, designing these APIs, but you're also testing them at the same time. I can see that based on the product name, the, the test value that I've given, uh, I can see that I've, I've found a total of 37 records. And, uh, this was a test value for how my API should respond. Uh, once my API has been, you know, uh, 
uh, pre-deployed. Uh, pre uh, pre-deployment testing i can on and uh, quickly deploy this to the server which means uh, they it, this is going to become available um http request right from my server uh, here i can just uh, quickly deploy this api and while i'm deploying you can see that this is the api that we have built it's a uh, get call to uh, get all the order items. Uh, while I'm deploying this, I also have the option to generate a test flow, which means I can also uh, using from the same platform, calling it the same platform for complete API lifecycle. I can not only test the API's pre-deployment, but I can also test the API uh, post and uh, create uh, my test cases and maintain those uh, for uh, the future. Uh, Right now, I just deployed a single API endpoint. However, I have the option to, uh, if I had, a, I, I have maintained, you know, different projects and I can also group and deploy uh, multiple endpoints and create uh, API groups all together. Now we can see that my trace showed a uh, deployment has been completed successfully and uh, now, as my API has been deployed, it becomes available to me on my server browser. Uh, so server browser is the place uh, where you can actually manage your complete APIs. So I just named my deployment test API. And here we can see that I have, uh, I've got two endpoints, order items. And this means since now it is available to me on my server browser, I can uh, call it from anywhere. And this can be, uh, this can be from any external tool. It can be, you know, uh, it's available on my server. So let's say I want to make a request to this endpoint that I just deployed uh, and send a request to it. I should to uh, see all the responses. And this API, it not only gets uh, example that we've built here, it not only gets my uh, data uh, from the database table, it also applies uh, you know, automated pagination to it. I have the ability to apply dynamic filters and sort parameters to it. So all of that is handled. Uh, all the common API functionalities has been handled uh, by a point and click interface. So let's say I want to uh, apply a filter which says that the quantity should be good in one, then I can apply a dynamic filter and send another uh, follow-up request. And this is, uh, this is, uh, you know, it, it just increases the power of uh, these API uh, while we are uh, building them. And thus it shows that it brings down the, build, uh, the time to build these APIs to uh, even minutes or less than that, yeah. So this was uh, one way where I could, uh, I could design my own APIs. However, we have the ability to also generate, uh, auto-generate some APIs. Uh, let's say if I want to build some CRUD operations, uh, credit for my database, I have the ability to uh, automatically generate CRUD flows, uh, CRUD API, and by CRUD I mean, uh, you know, all the uh, basic API operations such as creating, uh, adding records to a database, uh, getting records from a database, and so on. So you can see as soon as I click, uh, clicked on create uh, red CRUD flows, I could uh, see all the tables that are available to me in my database. And uh, here I can select exactly which uh, APIs I want to be able to uh, generate as part of my, um, as part of the uh, CRUD generation, right? So, hmm. Give it a minute. Yep. Right now. Yeah. So here I have the bank details table and I can see that uh, I can select exactly want to be deployed in the bank details table. And let's say I can also further select if I want to enable filters and sort and paginations to it. Right. And as soon as I click generate, uh, these APIs are going to be automatically generated uh, to my project and push them uh, to production and uh, get them live on the server. Uh, options that we have for map APIs. Um, we can uh, generate automatically readily available information for any of my APIs and I can import them in external to like Postman and share them with the developers. 
uh, I could also um, at any point in time, if I wish to, you know, uh, deactivate my endpoints at, uh, at the server, like I have a pointing link interface for that. Uh, we have a detailed log traces that are maintained uh, in order for you to deep your API errors. Uh, and similarly, uh, a monitoring dashboard that uh, that uh, captures all of your API traffic and it shows uh, uh, a complete uh, how you're coming along if let's say uh, and all the things that you can imagine for in uh, the response times but um, but uh, uh, what the average response time for your API is, uh, what uh, request per second are you receiving server, and uh, so on and so forth, right? Uh, so let me load my dashboard here. And in this dashboard, I can see that I have a total of 4,500 incoming to my server. I can see the average response time is in 13. I haven't sent much requests star so um, i have a low uh, and further on i can uh, recent logs uh, i i can get a much uh, you know uh, extensive report about how uh, the response statuses have looked like and also we have further uh, graphs that show me the request time that i have um i'd, I'd like to go over one more uh, example of an api that more uh, the most common APIs that we're seeing and we call it mashup means uh, I can uh, be able to combine uh, you know different different platforms and build your APIs on top of it so here I have an example where I'm actually calling uh, a third-party API which is a CRM hub and I'm uh, as soon as I get my request internally I, internally in my own API I'm doing another third-party API and passing the response relevant to my uh, business as uh, from third-party API now these flows can be basic as this, or uh, it can also get more complex. Uh, so I have another use case where I built a more complex case where I am actually integrating three different APIs uh, from APIs from three different platforms, in fact, and uh, forming my own API. So this looks a bit more complex. So where I am actually calling uh, API calls, uh, one, one uh, two of them are a third, and one is an internal. I'm calling. So uh, building an API mashup is a very common use case that we see uh, around the industry. Uh, I think this was about uh, for the uh, quick demo here. Uh, we can move on uh, to Q&A now. Thank you, Salia, for a great demo. Okay, let me just take some questions over here. Uh, so we have one question. Uh, how do you handle asynchronous API calls? Uh, Salia, would you like to take that one? Uh, sure. So, yeah, we have the just uh, not just deploy these asynchronously but you can also deploy these APIs as asynchronously which means uh, uh, you don't have to wait for the response altogether but you you can just uh, you know trigger your API and uh, timely uh, uh, check for your response when it's ready and uh, do your work you don't have to wait for it so yeah we, we queue those API requests and uh, you can uh, periodically check the status for those asynchronous API calls yeah short answer there was a checkbox for that so just check the box and it'll automatically yes, it was it into it. Okay, great. Uh, so we have another question. Uh, it is, uh, can we import our existing open API definitions and use them to create APIs? Uh, yeah. uh, definitely. So we have um, uh, a whole browser that you can maintain your own custom API collections. Uh, you, you can build, uh, you can import existing Postman collections and even uh, open API swagger definitions uh, to this tool automatically. And you can maintain your own library of uh, API connectors and uh, use them to actually build newer APIs. And you can also export your API that she was showing you. You can export it as an OPI, open API definition, aka swagger file. Uh, I think I have one more question here. So uh, can these APIs be deployed on cloud or in a Kubernetes environment? 
Uh, yes. Uh, so uh, it depends on where you want your server to be. You can uh, either uh, deploy it on premises or have it on cloud and even in a Kubernetes uh, container. Yeah. Yeah, and it's agnostic. Sure. It can be in Microsoft or Amazon or whatever hosting platform. So I guess that is, uh, those are all the questions that we have. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, you A replay link of this webinar will be sent to you. So if you missed anything today, you can always go back and check there. If you want to know more about this topic, you can go to stira.com slash resources and read upon it. Uh, thank you for a great time. Thank you, uh, Mansi and Mehdi, for joining us. Thank you, Mike, for joining us. Uh, uh, yeah, again, th thank you, Mencio and Mehdi. Uh, it was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you for, have, for having us and, and long live a God free API tools and API tooling. <laughs> I second that. Great. <laughs> so thank you for having us. Thank you. It was nice. Thank you. Thank you.